Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the BJJ Brick Podcast. I'm Joe Thomas. I'm here with Byron Jabara and Gary Hall, two of my good friends. Uh, guys, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How about you, uh, Byron, a.k.a. Princess Leah? Oh, yet again with that. Uh, doing great, and I wish I had a quote from her I could throw in there, but I I don't. Uh, I've been using the force a lot, and I know that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't even apply uh, much. I guess she did force float across space. But uh, anyway, doing great. Excited when, to bring you this very important episode uh, this week. Yes. When, uh, uh, besides my good friends Byron and Gary, I have another good friend on the show this week. We were able to interview my first coach, Nick Unander. Man, he had a little bit of a health scare on the mat, so we talk about that. And we talk about jujitsu. so it was great having him on. Stay tuned for the interview. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a good show. You know, Joe, you were talking about a little bit of health scare, and, uh, you know, I, I ran into, uh, not me, but uh, witnessed a health scare at the YMCA here this week, and, you know, it kind of, you know, made me think of an off-the-mat lesson, something that kind of happens in jiu-jitsu, but I was working out at the Y a couple days ago, and uh, there was a guy who passed out, uh, and I think it was from running. I didn't actually see why he passed out. Um but at first, I uh, was watching uh, the YMCA staff, who I assume, you know, the majority of them are trained as EMTs or I don't know what you, first responders, I don't know what the, the low level of training is, but I, I assume they have that because they look really professional and knew what to do. And and the cool thing about our Ys are, are you know, they have the, the shock things to shock your heart back if you have a... A heart attack or you know something um but yeah they AED also AED shock things that's yeah. what they're called okay you would know better yeah defibrillator defibrillator yeah. but the word shock things is after the defibrillator <laughs> shock things <laughs> yeah that goes like fire it. It, like you know, it. <laughs> making fun of a guy who you know has no experience but you know one thing i didn't realize too they also had uh oxygen masks and this was just the ymca staff and you know they had oxygen mask on and you know um yeah, as I walked by, I saw he had oxygen mask on. I was like, man, these guys are really, really on top of their game. And then a couple of minutes later, the the fire department arrives, and not Byron, but the uh, you know the good uh, ones. station twenty station twenty one. <laughs> I'm not trashing. I know you're a good firefighter, Byron, but station twenty one came up, and uh, and then uh, only reason I know that because I drove by it and uh, I looked at the thing. It said station twenty one. So, um, and then uh, the EMTs came up. Um, you know, and I was really impressed with the professionalism, and it made me think. You know, hey, if uh, you know if something happens to me there, uh, you know, I I feel in I feel like I'm in good hands. I mean, I, I thought the YMCA staff was awesome, and then uh, you know I know the fire departments down the street they got there really quick and uh, EMTs. So I was like, hey, if something happens to me, I'm in great shape. Um, and it kind of happened in a hallway between two different sections of uh, uh, lifting and lifting areas and, and I have to go back and forth depending on you know what exercise I'm doing and uh, you know the hallway was kind of crowded because there was a whole bunch of onlookers and you know when I'd walk by I'd try not to even look um, you know I, I, I would have my peripherals going as they say in, uh, say in that movie with Steve Carell but you know I, I didn't want to stare and watch it you know I figured you know, I'm not an expert. They, you know, this is a situation where you need to uh, take care of the patient. And, and plus, that guy is, to be honest, is probably embarrassed, uh, um, you know, with all this attention he's getting in the middle of the Y. And he's probably scared, too. Uh, well, I definitely know he's scared, not knowing what's, you know, what happened. And, uh, you know, that just made me think about, you know, jujitsu. And, you know, I was thinking about that guy. Will he show back up at the Y? You know, I mean, I. I bet he will. He looked like he was a pretty good shape uh, guy. But, you know, let's just say you're so embarrassed because, I mean, he had 50 onlookers there and in a small area, just all crowding around doing absolutely nothing and not even helping the situation. And, you know, I was just thinking that guy, you know, that could be a, you know, when 
when he realizes he's okay and he's going to survive, he's probably kind of a little bit embarrassed. And and I don't think he should be, but that's the way, you know, most people are going to think. And, you know, then I started thinking, well, he show back up at the Y, you know, if the doctor, get, you know, I, I don't want you to show back up on the Y if the doctor won't let you or says, hey, you've got something wrong, you need to you know, take some time off. But, you know, let's say he goes to the doctor and the doctor says everything's okay. You know, maybe you, I don't know what happened. Byron could probably give some scenarios about why you would pass out, but says he's okay. And, um, you know, it just made me think about jujitsu too. You know, we've, we always talk about growing your jujitsu school, being nice to that very first guy who shows up uh, to keep him coming. And, you know, that guy's going to tell his friends and you're going to have a bigger and bigger school. Um, but it just made me think about, you know, people, you know, you come to your first time, it's a tough situation. You don't know what's happened. And, you you know, I've heard people say, I can't believe you got caught in that move that, you know, that's total garbage. Or, or if you try a move, like, you know, I know when I first started, uh, I would be in somebody's guard, you know, Byron had me in guard and I would try to do an Americana while I was in Byron's guard. You know, I thought that was normal. I didn't, you know, know that I needed to pass guard. Um, but so, you know, and, and people will say, man, that's garbage. That's, uh, I can't believe you would do that. And, you know, we have to watch what we're saying on the jujitsu mat. Uh, you know, we can embarrass somebody or, or make them feel, you know, less worthy and they may not come back to jujitsu. And, you know, I know everybody listening to this show, you know, we want to grow jujitsu. We, we do jujitsu because we love it. And, uh, you know, I know last week, uh, we had an article for men's health. When does jujitsu get in men's health? And that just shows you how this, this sport is growing and, and we want to keep it growing. So, you know, when you, when you have somebody new or you see somebody do a, something a little strange, you know, be cognizant of their feelings. Uh, we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. We want them, you know, to keep showing up in jujitsu and having a good time. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And when it comes to uh, possibly embarrassing uh, students on the mat, context is important. Uh, we have a friend of the show, Brian Freeman, who has almost no use of his legs, and he's a great grappler. But because of his limited physical abilities, he's got to do some unorthodox things. And I've watched some of his videos, and I've played with some of the things he does. And one example is attacking people's arms when they have your back. There's kind of a, a figure four arm lock you can do. And, uh, you know, I've caught a few people with it. And if they're long-term training partners, yeah, it's probably okay for me to kind of chuckle a little bit and, and give them a hard time. Man, you shouldn't get submitted when you have my back. But if it's a newer student and they're just learning the back, uh, that wouldn't be the time or place. So context is important. It's not so much about what you're saying, but how you're saying it, and when you're saying it, and who you're saying it to. And, uh, yeah, we just need to be aware of that. Good point, Joe. I, I like that context part. And looking at this whole thing from the perspective of the patient, uh, that might be the last time you see that person at the Y, not because that they physically can't work out anymore, but if the guy is embarrassed enough around people that he has been used to working out in front of and all that sort of thing, he may just stop going and, and working out there because it, he had an embarrassing event there. It, it may not be embarrassing to him at all. I don't know his what he feels about it, but if your students leave the gym embarrassed about something, <laughs> that. That puts a little bit of a barrier for them to come back. Yeah, and it's it's hard enough to jujitsu as it is. I know we've all talked about starting. Um, you know, I, you guys have all heard my story about I was afraid to show up the first day, and I drove by the place and didn't go in. And you know, every every if we can just make it more inviting, um, the better chance of these people keep coming back. Yeah, and what, one point here, Gary, I know you don't know this guy personally, but certainly some people at the gym do know the guy. Uh, you can reach out to them afterwards. It's bound to happen in jiu-jitsu that guys are going to have things happen that are embarrassing. And uh, you, you can reach out to them afterwards. You see somebody get embarrassed about something on the match, you can just go sit next to them after class and say, man, that thing that just happened, happened to me too. And, you know, it really sucked, but... Uh, you'll get through it. Nobody's going to remember this a month from now. Just don't worry about it. So uh, when it does happen, do some uh, repair work on the backside. I think sometimes. The- and that's what, and don't tell me that's what she said, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, I didn't even think about that, Joe, because I was so <laughs> enamored with what you were saying. And, you know, while you were talking about what you're doing there, Joe, and what you mentioned the first time, I was just thinking, you know, 
the house of jujitsu down there in Texas, uh, is lucky to have you as a teammate. Um, you know, I, just the stuff you always talk about the way you talk about your training partners and everything like you bring a lot to that school. Um, and, uh, I was just thinking, you know, I'm, it's a pleasure to know you, you know, I wish I got to train with you more often, but I can just tell Joe that you're a major asset to the school just by, you know, what you said, you know, just in this, but you know, not just what you said this time, but you know, what you said all the time. And, and Byron, you know, I, I've always said the same thing about you too. You know, you are, you are an ambassador to the sport and, uh, it's, uh, it's cool to be, know you two guys and socialize with you two guys. Um, you know, you guys are, you guys are something special, but just with what you're saying there, Joe, it made me just think that what a freaking great training partner you are. Man, that's why they call us the three amigos. Bueno. <laughs> yep. I, not to keep bringing this up. This is a good one, uh, Gary. You kind of stumbled upon something that is real important. I think some students, when they go compete, if it goes poorly, they are embarrassed to come back to class. And that's, that's, should not be the way it is. You should. You went out there. You did it. You you tried your best, and it it may or may not work out good for you. But your teammate, your 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 team doesn't think that's like funny or anything. Like they're rooting for you. They want you to do well, but they know that there's a chance that it won't go well. And so just come back to the mats. You you know people might say, hey, good try or whatever. But most people aren't really worried about. Um, you shouldn't feel embarrassed for your performance because next week it's over and uh, they're back to doing their thing. They're back to working on their own games. Like they're not worried about what your, you know, how your performance was. Uh, so I, I do feel like sometimes people go compete and then they don't come back. I think maybe they're a little bit embarrassed and they don't want to face the, the team for letting them down or whatever. No, it's, it's your own journey. And, and we've all had, you know, bumps and bruises and losses and wins along our journey. So, uh, you know, take that. And uh, get back to class. Get back to getting better. Hey, you know what, Byron? I talked about what you could do on the back end of things if when students are embarrassed. But what you're saying here reminds me that there's work you can do on the front end. And, and that is to develop a culture in your gym where when you're going to a tournament, you got people going for the first time. You kind of put the message out. Everybody knows. One of you guys may win gold today. And one of you guys may be on the wrong end of the quickest submission of the day. It doesn't matter which of those students you are. What matters is you guys are putting it on the line. You've put in the work to go to this tournament. That's what's important. As you say that to the team, like you look, you know, you have the team sitting in front of you. you look Joe dead in the eyes. One of you guys might <laughs> win a, a, a goal That's today. Context. And then look over to Gary and say, and one of you guys might be on the wrong end of the quickest <laughs> submission. <laughs> Call it out, but yep. don't do it so well, uh, you know. <laughs> yep, I get that a lot. <laughs> I think sometimes when uh, when we do something like that, like go compete, we have a purpose or or a goal, and uh, and the, the I guess the quote has something to do with that. Definitiveness of purpose is the starting point of all achievement, and uh, that's. That, that's a great quote because it, if you want to achieve something, you first need to at least define it to yourself. What am I trying to achieve? And in and, and doing that, you bring yourself many other things that you're going to have to do along the way. Let's just say uh, you're 200 pounds and you're a blue belt and you want to go win uh, or do well at this tournament in two months. So it could define that. You know, what does that look like? What do you have to do? Well, maybe it, maybe it's a 190 pound class. You got to lose 10 pounds as well. Uh, maybe you have to amp up your cardio. It's like as soon as you define what your goal is, maybe you want to get uh, a raise or get a new job altogether. As soon as you define that, start looking at the elements that make that happen and start attacking those. And and what seems like it will be a very difficult goal quickly becomes possible as you break this big goal into smaller things. You know, Byron, that makes me think about you, you know, when you were starting this podcast, uh, you know, you had to have a purpose for this podcast, you know, uh, you know, look, look at us right now, um, episode 317. I mean, you know, 
I didn't think we'd ever make 317. I know you did, though, because you had that purpose. You know, you're the one who started all this. And, you know, I remember looking at your notes, uh, you know, the purpose of it. You had timelines on what you needed to do. And, and I remember one thing that really stuck out to me is you had a note in there. I have to find a co-host who puts me to shame in all aspects of jiu-jitsu and life. And, uh, you know, you would have never got to where you are at now without putting that down on paper and finding that person. Yeah, and it took a while, but Joe eventually appeared. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say he still has that on his list of goals. <laughs> we're, we're just placeholders. He's still looking. Boy, that backfired quickly. <laughs> Twice. Twice. <laughs> But we don't no, want that, you guys that, to. Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say that's a that's a great quote, and uh, I was thinking that when you find that purpose, when you define your purpose, uh, that often comes around the same period of your jujitsu journey as when you might be most likely to have an embarrassing situation arise on the mats, and that's generally probably within your first year of jujitsu. That first year can be tough. It's a hard year to navigate through. Gary, wouldn't it be awesome if there was a resource to help new students get through that first year? Joe, I'm glad you asked about that because we do, well, not we, uh, BJJ Brick and Byron created an audio book. It's called Your First Year of BJJ, um, and it's uh, two and a half hours of content, you know, kind of like the show, um, but uh, it's only $11.99, and basically it's going to help you get through your first, which, uh, you know, Joe, I think you mentioned, is the mo- can be your most difficult year of training. Um, we want to simplify jujitsu and help you find joy in it. Um, you know, uh, we, we've talked about it numerous times today. We want to grow jujitsu. And uh, and if we can get people out of that first year, you have a better chance of surviving. Um, but, you know, it goes, uh, talks about everything that you're going to do in your first year of jujitsu from, you know, finding the right school to, uh, you know, what moves to work on, uh, what, whether or not you should enter a tournament. Um, but uh, one of my favorites is, is finding that right school. If, if you go to a really hardcore you know, school and, and that's not something you're looking for. And when I say hardcore, I mean a, a really competitive base school, you know, maybe as a bunch of MMA fighters, uh, you know, that may not be your school or uh, you may be looking for, you know, a self-defense type of school, you know, where self-defense is more in their curriculum. But, um, you know, if, if you live in a larger area where there's, you know, multiple schools and schedule, um, you know, if, if you work second shift and you need a, a morning, you know, class, uh, um, you know, not all schools may not have that. So, uh, you know, finding that right school is very important to keeping you in that game. But check it out. We have a link to it on the show notes. It's got great reviews. Uh, Byron's w- w- Byron's first audio book. Uh, you know, it, it's been around for a long time now. And uh, like I said, many great reviews. So uh, uh, check the link on the show notes. Uh, tell your friends about it. And, you know, it's getting time. It's getting close to Christmas. Uh, makes a great Christmas <laughs> gift. Uh, yeah, I guess it, it could be a Christmas gift. But I don't want you to wait that long to start training or to start getting these benefits. Even if you're training for six months or nine months, uh, there will be some information here that will help you along your way. So not just for the brand new person, but anywhere in that first year, uh, I think we've got some good advice in there for you to, to help you out. Awesome. So go get the book. And uh, for now, stay tuned for the interview. We'd like to welcome Nick Unander to the BJJ Brick. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. He has had a short career as a pharmacist. He got fired because he was recommending jujitsu for 95% of his patients. His idea of a performance-enhancing drug is better technique. He has been tested for this, and the results were positive. Chuck Norris's wife has a tattoo of his face. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. Well, Nick, welcome back to the BJJ Brick Podcast. How are you doing today? Very good. Thank you, Joe. Great to talk to you again. It's been about a year since our last conversation, so it's good to be back on here. Yeah, it's, um, it's great to have you. 
Uh, give us a quick reintroduction for anybody who was not listening on the first podcast. Well, my name is uh, Nick Unander, and I'm a uh, Carlson Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioner under Marcelo Alonso from Seattle. And about 11 years ago, I decided to leave the U.S. and uh, travel and teach Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And the first country I went to was Greece, where I opened a school and had it for about six and some people belt and then some things happened and uh i ended up moving to cyprus which is where i'm at now and uh for the past year and a half i've been here teaching jiu-jitsu in paralimni cyprus which is a little coastal town on the island near a very popular tourist resort called ayanapa so uh that's where i'm at right now and i've been training about uh probably 26 27 years brazilian jiu jitsu and uh still enjoying it and teaching and training and yeah so that's a in a nutshell long story short awesome. but i want to say i did on our last podcast a lot of feedback nice to be on bjj brick because a lot of people listen to that and i have it on my website nickbjj.com where you're able to listen to the podcast and a lot of Believe it or not, a lot of students that come, they come because they heard the podcast and they're like, wow, that sounds like a good philosophy and a good place to train. So that's cool. So I want to thank BJJ Brick for that, for sure. Oh, man. Appreciate the kind words, Nick. Uh, that sounds like a win-win for both of us. So, you bet. Do you get a lot of uh, tourist traffic at the school or are most of your students local? I do. In the summertime, it's awesome because we get students from all over the world, Russia, in all over Europe, the United States, even some from South America, Peru, Brazil, and they look me up and they are, they're always welcome on the map. They come visit and, you know, all levels too, which is really cool. So we get kind of a cross section and we can kind of see what's going on in different parts of the world. You know, you get a purple belt from Siberia and then you get a purple belt from the UK and you can say, wow, it's really similar, you know, the things they're learning or, or that's really different, you know, and it's it's really kind of neat man that's we enjoy we do enjoy that in the summertime where in the winter we have our regulars that live here that train with us and they get that back rolling people from different countries and different schools affiliations etc yeah I, i think exposure to other ideas and other training methods and i think that's really valuable yeah for sure i just had a couple from the uk they came and it was a you know a married couple and they brought their two kids with them and the two kids trained jujitsu and the mother and father trained jujitsu and the father's a blue belt and the mother's a four stripe white belt and the kids are like three or four years training and they they were like nine years old or something and it was just really really neat to see you know so it gives you a good feeling yeah that's awesome uh, Nick since the last time we talked in fact it was just recently you had a, a little bit of a health scare. And uh, you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I do. Uh, it's you know I'm 52 years old now, and the problem with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is that you, after doing it for so many years, you know most of us older guys were in really good physical condition, and we feel like we're in our 20s, you know, mm-hmm. and we roll with younger guys, and we can keep up with them and smash them sometimes, and. You know, it's if you continue exercising hard and you push yourself hard, you're able to keep up. But the problem is, is that, you know, the years go by and getting old. So like a racehorse, uh, I used it as an analogy. You know, I'm 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 still fit as a racehorse, but an old racehorse. (laughs) So the problem was what happened was I had two two young guys from uh, the UK that came and visited and they were teenagers but had been training jujitsu for like eight to ten years so they rolled like black belts and i rolled with both of them during my 330 class pretty hard and uh then i went home and had some food had a little nap and i went back to teach my evening class and went hard again because i had a bunch of people there then and then i usually have this routine i do after class which includes push up it up thing I was getting ready to go do my push-ups and I dropped down and I was I usually do about 100 and I was at 30 and all of a sudden I just felt really lightheaded like I was on that 30 and then all of a sudden my heart felt like it was going to stop and 
I stood up and my students were still there and I kind of walked a little bit and I thought, man, this isn't good. I'm about to pass out. And I basically fell on the floor. They all came over to see what was going on and I couldn't move. And then all of a sudden I started getting really scared because I was panicking a little bit and it felt like my heart was going to stop. And, you know, they were trying to kind of, I think, you know, what could this be? You know, and I'm, am I having a heart attack? Am I going to die right here on the mat? And I still couldn't move, and so they called an ambulance, and the ambulance came and took me out of the school in a stretcher, got rushed to the hospital, ended up in the, and then I ended up in the intensive care unit for two days on a drip trying to get my heart, because my heart had had an arrhythmia where it was beating, it wasn't beating uh, with the right rhythm. And uh, they put this drip on me to try to get my heart back to normal, and it took 24 hours for it to uh, stabilize. And then I had all the tests, the CAT scans, the blood work, and all that stuff. It was just a really scary experience, you know, and just makes you realize that we're all mortal and got to kind of watch yourself. And I basically the the bottom line is I need to slow down a little bit, so which is kind of sad in a way. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, but but you'll slow down smart, so you'll you'll still be active. You'll just do it smart. I, I was wondering where your headspace was that next forty eight hours. Did you think about your livelihood? Your, I mean, you are you do jujitsu. That's what you do. Uh, yeah, for sure, for sure. It was top of my mind, man. I thought this is you know if I can't go back and train and you know I will teach. I went back and I started teaching almost right away when I got out of the hospital, but <clears throat> I couldn't really do anything. So just showing technique and, you know, letting my students do the, do the stuff. And I mean, I've always said, even if I ended up in a wheelchair, I'd still teach jujitsu, you know, I'd still be in there teaching. So I think that as somebody that's been doing it for a really long time, you're still able to communicate drills and how techniques are done and you know correct things as a coach i mean if you look at basketball coach or football coach or whatever the coach is they're not all professional players right but, you know how it is as a jiu-jitsu on all there and demonstrating that your techniques work and that this stuff is is the real deal and so that you know and then also the fact that you know we spend as instructors a lot of time on the mat, a lot of time with our students, and um, it makes you kind of think about other things as well. Like, you know, what other things do you do and what other things do you enjoy doing and that you want to do? So, yeah, I guess it just makes you look at your whole life and what <laughs> what you're up to. You know, it kind of focuses things. So, yeah, it was scary. That's all I have to say. And one of the things that really helped, though, I want to say is that all – People that posted photos of what had happened, and really, I posted them just to show, man, you got to be careful and you got to take care of your health and and whatnot. But I got hundreds and hundreds of personal letters and comments to get better and trying to, you know, give some words of encouragement. So that was really the the BJJ community, because that's mostly what I have on my Facebook. Really reached out and were really supportive and. That was that was heartwarming, you know. You know, so yeah, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. I'm not surprised at all. The, our community is awesome. Uh, yeah. Nick, what's the uh, prognosis going forward? Are, are you clear at this point? Or are you still doctors still observing? What's going on going forward? I had all my blood work done. Um, I had a CT scan. I had ultrasound of my heart, and basically, I have a little tiny hole between my ventricles but i probably had that since i was born and the right side of my heart is slightly larger than the left um, but that's normal in athletes that have worked out hard for many many years so um basically i'm taking beta blocker to avoid having arrhythmia again because arrhythmia is a uh, is when your heart beats um early and so those pills assure that my heart will continue to beat uh, on a regular uh, regular interval. And so I'm taking those every day in the morning and in the evening. But they didn't find anything else, you know, and other than that, my blood work was good. I have a little bit, my cholesterol is a little bit high because I eat too much whatever, <laughs> 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 you know, but, but nothing, nothing out of the ordinary, you know, so 
that that was encouraging. At least I didn't have to, you know, there wasn't something something that they could find that was wrong with my heart that they would have to fix. Just have there is more of the prognosis. Yeah. So my doctor said I need to take it easy with my workouts and with how hard I push myself, and uh, that's just preventative medicine, I guess. Mm. Okay. So that was that. Not fun though. I, I would say my my advice to people is that if you're young. And you're doing jujitsu, or you're, or you want to stay fit, or whatever it is, you should really think about one day you'll be old. So if you're drinking and smoking and partying and doing all this kind of stuff, and yourself feel like destructible, because I used to feel that way. Well, I can tell you, once you get to be in your fifties, you start to realize how destructible you can be. So, <laughs> you know, if he, I if I gave any advice to my old self when I was younger, it would be like just be more healthy you know and with that i have i had before like for the past almost a year now i stopped eating meat red meat um i'm not a vegan i'm not a vegetarian but i just don't eat any meat products um i've been eating fish vegetables fruit so you know my diet is pretty healthy yeah i guess for the rest of us that's one of the scary things about this nick is you all have been in my mind sort of the picture of healthy living and if this doesn't happen to you man it can happen to anybody yeah but i will say that that day it was for almost 40 degrees celsius i had worked out really hard like too hard basically i'd overdone it and so my electrolytes were probably down there was probably a lot of things going on and that thing on my heart it's an electric it's because your heart goes with electrical signals, right? That makes a beat on a, at a regular heartbeat. But it became irregular where they short circuit, you know, and then it went into an irregular heartbeat, and it just wasn't pumping blood around my body. Right. It, so it can, your heart just kind of it can happen to anybody at any age if you overdo it. Yeah, your heart's working like crazy, but it's really not moving any oxygen, any blood work needs to go. Exactly. And, exactly. and and for our U.S. listeners, forty degrees Celsius is almost one hundred and five degrees. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Pr- pr- it, pretty warm hot. day. Yeah, Cyprus is hot in the summer. July, August, you suffer. It's really hot. So, I feel good. Like my levels are okay, and I'm just, you know, I've I've been rolling, but just really light, and I try to stay on top all the time now instead of you know a lot of times i like to fight out from the bottom i like to push myself but now i've been kind of just focusing on smashing and that's all right that works <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you you have every reason to to go ahead and play the top game now and <laughs> when some guy starts you know some lower belt starts going hard on me i'm like all right i'm just gonna get on top of you and we're gonna spend the next five minutes with me smashing you into the mat because i need to relax <laughs> so Nick one thing about an incident like this when it happened to you I thought man it's hard hard to see a guy have his life possibly drastically changed and so man it got me thinking about some of the bigger things and uh, yeah. so you, you've used martial arts to take you all around the world you've trained a lot of different places um who who who's some of the more interesting people that you've trained with? Can you think of somebody like uh, you maybe trained with back in the day that you're just glad you did? I can say, you know, one of the most memorable training sessions I ever had was with Rodrigo Medeiros of JJ uh, team. He's in California, and this was when I was a blue belt. <laughs> to be honest, it was a long time ago. Um, and he marked me for a long time, you know, my, I rolled with him for like an hour and I just was really amazed at, at how good and how smooth and how technical he was and, and just how it felt to roll with someone like that. And then recently as a black belt, um, there was, there's a Brazilian guy here on the Island who's actually recently left back to Brazil. And his name is uh, Lucas. I don't know his last name, but Lucas. He's uh, 
he started training when he was three years old, and he's the nephew of uh, the guy that started the Alliance okay. Federation. Um, and just phenomenal. 26 years old, you know, uh, about 100 kilos, which is, what, 190, 200 pounds of muscle and flexibility and jiu-jitsu technique. Again, that's just amazing. Um and I'm just I'm just always amazed at these guys that you roll with that aren't you don't really feel them and then all of a sudden you're getting choked. <laughs> yeah. and, and at my level, it's <laughs> it, you know because usually I'm the like like I would roll with a blue belt or you know a white belt or whatever, and this guy rolls with me the same way. Wow. And what it does is basically shows you, you know, you're, <laughs> you, there's, there's still so much training to do. I don't think it's the learning. I think it's more, there's so much training to do that you can, you can reach levels that you can't even imagine, you know, cause a lot of people and black belts, especially they kind of get in this mode where they're a black belt and they're really, really good. And they're going to give anybody a, <laughs> There are there are black belts and then there are black belts, you know. Yeah. Because you look at some of these world champion guys that you get basically um, hobbyists that go in and compete in the world championships and they get matched up against uh, a guy like what's his name, uh, the, the John Donner Donner's student. What's the guy's name again? Oh, I, I know I know who you're talking about. Uh, are you talking about Dil- Dylan or the other guy? Uh, brother whatever yeah and you know and you watch him fight and he beat a guy what it was like 54 to zero and that was it's just you know but but a lot of these guys are really good like you're really good i consider like my jujitsu is is good but man there's always somebody out there that's going to show you what's up yeah i, I think jujitsu is unique in the fact i'm listening to you talk about getting schooled by this youngster and you're happy about it. And I don't think there's many other sports where you get that, you know, a guy doesn't go out and play one-on-one basketball with somebody and lose 30 to two and, and like, Oh, that was an exciting game. But some, something about us jujitsu practitioners. Yeah. So Nick, what's uh there's some new things going on with your gym since the last time we talked, you want to get into that a little bit? Sure. Um, basically we've been, redecorating the whole place we had a flood in the gym during the winter and uh we had to take everything out of the area and clean everything and bring everything back in and in doing so basically decided to design the gym around our new um logo which was designed by my girlfriend nikki ruddy who used to work for the nike company and marketing so she's really good at graphic design and all that kind of thing and so that logo, the, the two, we did, uh, developed that logo for our team logo. And then we also uh, took on a couple of affiliations, one in Vienna and one in South Africa. And basically, we didn't chase those. The people that have those schools came to me and, you know, were interested in discussing affiliation um and so that that happened which was really cool and we came up with kind of a a whole uh philosophy of our school and how we want to see us and how we want our affiliates to be um which which has worked out pretty well and basically through our love of the art we connect and basically it's all about connection um yeah, and so on the website we've included our two on our Nick BJJ website we've included our affiliates Stephanie Cram in Vienna, Austria, and Daryl Thought in Durban, South Africa. Um, and they basically are just running small schools in their area and trying to you know uh, promote jujitsu and have a very similar flag. And so we get along really well, and uh, it's fun. So, so will you manage this completely uh, online, or are the instructors going to come visit you? Or are you going to go visit them? How's all that going to work? Both. Uh, Stephanie is close by in Vienna, and so she she has come here 
Uh, she won the world championships for blue belt, master's blue belt, and uh, she had been a blue belt for many years. And I ended up promoting her to purple belt. And then uh, Daryl in South Africa has been training like 16 years, but he has no one to promote him. So he, I think, has been a brown belt for the last years. Um, so it's <laughs> time, time, time for him to be promoted probably as well. But um, I will, I've been invited to go down and see him and uh, probably go, you know, it's, it, it's kind of a loose affiliation and uh, we try to keep it simple for everybody. So, you know, when it's convenient and when we can get together, then we will. Perfect. Yeah. It's not, you know, it's not a Gracie Baja or a big, big time affiliation like Atos or something like that, where we have very strict rules. Right. Pretty, you know, basically all about connection, you know, that's. Yep. Well, that's exciting. I remember when you launched that and I uh, remember when those two schools signed up under you not long ago and I was excited to see that. Yeah, it's nice okay. to see jujitsu grow, man. That's it. That's the bottom line. And recently, we bought it. Me and my girlfriend bought a van. I was so going to ask you about that. Tell me about your big adventure. Yeah. Well, this was shortly after I got out of the hospital. We had been we've been watching the YouTube videos about people that you know uh, convert their vans into camper vans and this sort of thing. And it just it, to us, it's you know, attracted a lot of. And so we found a Volkswagen online and uh, went to see it. And right now we took it to our mechanic and it's all checked out. So it's a, uh, it's a T5 Volkswagen, um, just a nice old Volkswagen van, 2004. And we're going to convert the whole thing and make it into a camper and put a bed in there and refrigerator and everything like that. And eventually we want to take it around Europe and maybe stop at a bunch of academies on the way and do some training and some seminars and some just have some fun with the whole traveling in a van and teaching jujitsu. Awesome. Man, I look forward to that. Doing right. girlfriend to now since I've been here, she's getting really good as well. So I always have a training partner with me. Nice. Which is cool. <laughs> is is there a ferry from the island of the mainland or you gotta ship the van? Well, right now there isn't. Right now we're waiting. Hopefully they're going to make a service between the city of uh, Limassol and Athens, Greece. And if they do that, it would be a ferry that you can take the you can take your your vehicle on, and then we would be connected. And so they're talking about doing that now. But for now, we would have to ship it separately and then go meet it wherever it ends up. So, but for now, we're going to use the van basically to go around and try gear around and stay in different places and you know i think it's just the whole thing about having freedom to move freedom to stay wherever you're at not have to book a hotel you can just go park your van and you know have all your stuff with you and sleep and wake up and look at the sea and you know have your dog with you nobody's going to complain and so it's it's in it's in the spirit of freedom you know spirit of living living the dream basically nice <laughs> you know <laughs> I'm all about living the dream. Get that shirt, by the way. <laughs> yes, indeed. Nick, it's been good to catch up with you on a personal level. I was hoping you had enough time to answer a few questions that might help some of our listeners out. I just grabbed five questions uh, that I see floating around. Uh, ready to go? Sure. Okay. So one question I see a lot, and I'm going to break this down into three three subparts, but what should I, what should I be working on at – this point i see that question asked a lot so how about a, a really new student nick two to three months in maybe they're at a big school and they kind of get lost in the crowd and they're asking you when i'm in class what should i be focusing on first be focused on whatever it is the instructor is teaching you during that particular class <laughs> that's a good answer to start with <laughs> instructor is showing a technique try to be focused on the technique and all the intricacies of that technique and kind of what you're supposed to be coming away with, what your instructor is trying to communicate to you in teaching you that specific technique. And then uh, secondly is, is to use your time wisely. If you get to class early, then drill something that you 
that you've learned or that you think you need work on or, or even something that you know really well that you just want to continue to polish and, you know, use your time wisely. And uh, thirdly is if you are rolling time, you get some rolling time during class, don't try to roll to kill your opponent or show who's better. Just roll to learn, man. Always roll to learn. Be relaxed. Be curious about what other people are doing to you so you can pick up on it and be able to benefit from it. And I think that's really important. I think too many people go into a grappling scenario and just want to beat the other person, just want to win that match at all costs, even in class. And it's, you know, I think people need to remember more that it's not a competition. You're there to learn. And that's really important. So in respect, that's, that's, did I answer that? That's, that's a great answer, Nick. Uh, and then as they, they get a little further in, when, when a student's a year, year and a half in, where should their game be going at that point? What should they be thinking about as far as, um, you know, kind of a collection of techniques and how they fit together? Well, I can speak only from how I teach, you know, and, and many of my students now are at that point because I've been here for about a year and a half. And they're all about three to four stripes on their white belt right now. And really what I've tried to do, and this is what I said during our last podcast, is I've tried to give them the additional or your side control transitions, your mount, your knee on the belly, your sweeps, your just your, your basic foundation things. If you say, okay, we have spider guard, we have lasso guard, we have X guard, we have uh, worm guard, we have regular clothes guard, we have half guard, you know, and, and being familiar with all of those different styles of guard and being familiar with all of your different styles of, of working side controls, all of your different styles of working guard passes just going, you know, I expect my students to know if I say, okay, you know, show me a spider guard, they should be able to show me a spider guard. As they get higher, I'm like, okay, show me a spider guard with two sweeps. They should be able to show me a spider guard with two sweeps or whatever. You know, I, I think just familiarity with the language and the foundational moves of jujitsu as they are today. Because today we have a lot more foundational moves than we did back in the old days when I started training. Yeah, the, um, the sport's definitely grown, ex yeah. expanded a lot. It has, you know, and there's so much, there's so many different games there. And it was like, you know, sometimes you, like, we have a long visit, you know, and there's a lot of new school technique. And when someone comes in and they're, they've just been training new school technique, I know it right away. I can feel it when I roll with them. They're, they're doing, they all kind of do exactly the same thing. You know, a, a little, they do like a Toriando tar pass, you know, and they're trying to push the knee through and drop the shoulder down on one side, trying to push the knee through and drop the shoulder down on the other side, where I see very few like going into a combat position, doing a knee slide, uh, a tight knee slide pass or something where they're, they're using their shoulder pressure to, to get the pass through. I think there's a lot more like open, open game trying to decide. They get there, just muckle down, you know, and I think that comes from the IBJJF and competition jujitsu and scoring points and getting advantages and things of that nature. Yeah. But I think that, sorry, go ahead. As I say, a lot of times you, you get a hold of those guys, slow them down and throw some old school stuff at them. And that's new to them. A lot of times they don't know what to do that's with it. New to them. They haven't experienced it because they all grapple, you know, there's like this, they're all grappling a very similar way, and so they're used to dealing with each other. But you're right. Once the old school game comes into play, and that's why they say old school, but I think the name is, you know, old school is more uh, longer, longer lived techniques, techniques that made it through everything that still worked to this day, you know? Yeah, I was watching a, a fight to win comp pro competition last night, and there was a ton of closed guard in it. And the commentators were commenting on that. And uh, perhaps we're going to see a resurgence of some of that, uh, like you say, long lived, uh, some of the original technique. Yeah, yeah, and I, it, it works. I know it works because you know if I it doesn't matter the level. If I if I decide I'm going to go in and I'm going to do a smash pass 
and I'm going to use my, I'm going to use the pressure that I'm able to, to get from having done that for years and angle and how to stay in position and how to really make the person underneath me suffer from, from lack of breath <laughs> and, and, and pressure on them. Then, you know, because I don't think that you, you can't understand that unless you've experienced it. And I think that back in the old days, we used to experience it every day in class because some higher belt was just putting a knee on the stomach and smashing you down and then going into side control and pressing all the air out of your lungs. And you just want to tap from not being able to breathe. Yeah, you're, you know? you're, you're just begging for them to pass already. Begging them to pass or begging them to submit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm holding my arm right here. Go ahead and take it, man. <laughs> take it. You know, I did that at the European Championships because the guy was holding me down and he wouldn't move. And so I did. I put my arm out and uh, I'm like, take my arm. Dude, take my arm. Please make a move. And he just – he wouldn't move. He wouldn't grab my arm because it would have created just enough space for me to escape. Yep. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> well, sounds like he had a game plan for the tournament. So He was a judo guy. Okay. He was a judo guy and he got me inside control and he used, you know, that, you know, judo guys want to hold you for 20 seconds on the ground and not move. And he had just an amazing side face. He was penalty after penalty during the match, but yeah. he didn't care because he'd already scored. Yep. <clears throat> so, Nick, here's another question I get asked a lot. Um, it, it always goes along these lines like, I'm a white belt and the school I go to, it's almost all upper belts. They're big, strong, young guys. And I, I just spend the entire class getting crushed. How can I get better during rolling when I'm just always a step behind? Mm. Well, I think that that answer is twofold. One is if you do go to another school and they're all higher belts than you, they should be crushing. Number one. So that's kind of, you know, I mean, if I, if I have lower belts and, and I'm trying to teach them something, I'm not crushing them. I'm, you know, playing guard pass with them and kind of correcting them as they go. I mean, I think in any school, we should all want our students to progress and we should do everything we can as higher belts to help them do that. And crushing them does not help them progress. And I know in some areas and some bigger schools maybe that philosophy isn't there and they just say ah you're a white belt you're going to suffer through it you're going to be here for a long time anyway we're just going to crush you until you start to learn and that's going to that's going to take so this and that should take time of their own or during class if they get the time to do drills work slowly understand the drills understand the movement practice their mobility drills you know, and really focus. And, and again, focusing on the basics. I mean, I think you, that that can't be said enough that you need to focus on the basics. Um, and, you know, nowadays there are so many resources online with YouTube to learn things and to look at different, different uh, ideas about guard pass or about sweep, whatever it is you're looking for. You can find a tutorial online free. But then it's more than just watching that. It's take, taking little things of that, bringing them to class, grabbing a partner, and working it with them until you until you understand it, until it makes sense from a from a practical standpoint, not just looking at it online. I recently took up guitar since I was in the hospital, so I've I've been playing now for three weeks, and I've been using YouTube to learn, and I'm telling you, I've learned to play guitar. You know, I can play, I can play some Pink Floyd. I can play, you know, Old Man, that song. I can play some jazz. There are so many different styles you can pick up. But again, you hold my hand, stop the tape, drill the drill, whatever they're doing with their fingers, start the tape again, go back sometimes and do it again. So I think when you use these resources properly, there's a lot to be gained from it. But if you just look at it, I don't think you're going to gain as much. Yeah. So basically, if a student comes to you with a similar question to this, if they're if they're I'm always getting swept or I'm always getting submitted from guard or I'm always getting crushed as I pose the question, you can go on and, and search specifically for that, you know, uh, yep. and and you're right. The YouTube is a great resource. Um, and, and there's a lot of yeah, guys I, out there that put out good, good material at no cost. Yeah. 
And if they come to me and they say, hey, man, this is happening to me and I can't seem to deal with it, well, obviously I'm going to say, okay, let's see, let's see where we're at, you know, try to develop something that's going to help them and then say, okay, drill this, drill this. You need to find a partner that, like if for side control escapes, for example, if you are getting stuck in side control and you're never able to escape the position, all right, let's find a few different escapes that you can string together and use in conjunction with each other to create an escape that's going to work for you and find that combination. Because I think anything you do is a combination of techniques that work together to get you where you want to be. I don't think there's any one technique. It's like a, a one punch, you know, there's never one punch. You need a couple of jabs and a cross and then you're in. Yep. But one cross, eh, it's going to be pretty predictable after a while, right? Yep, it's tough to win with only one tool. Yeah, and everybody knows, you know, everybody knows all the different escapes, but they don't know the combinations of the escapes. Just like the combination of a of a of a lock, you've got the numbers on the board. You know, okay, there's ten numbers on that board: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, what can you use code? And I think it's the same with jujitsu. You have a certain number of different escapes and which ones are you going to put together or which is the right one at that moment, at that movement of your opponent to get your escape. Well said. Here's another one, Nick. I can only make it to class one or two times a week. And, uh, you know, you hear everybody say two times a week, three times a week. That's what it takes to get better. What advice do you have for somebody that, that they really want to get better at jujitsu, but they just can't come twice a week every week? Okay, first of all, twice that they make sure that they are fully focused on the class when they come and that they're going to take all that information in. Um, I had a friend of mine. He could only train once a week. He worked for FedEx. He could only train at our Saturday class, and uh, this was years ago, and he ended up getting his black belt after many years of training, but during the week when he was working, you know, when he, when he would have time, he had a little gym in his basement and he had his, his tools down there to do drills, to stay in shape, to be fit, uh, do his mobility drills and everything, and keep to in his mind. And now, and look, uh, don't forget we didn't have YouTube back then, so he had no reference. He just had what he was learning in class to bring back and work on on his own in his basement with a heavy bag or with whatever he could, he could get to help him out. Um, sometimes I would go over and work with him as well. But, uh, I think that, you know, coming, first of all, twice a week is pretty good. Actually twice a week you can, you can improve, but I still think you need to, you need to do things on your own. You need to have a space where you can drill and stretch and your mind, jiu-jitsu you know so i think i think that yeah that's, that's the advice i would give you know i mean even me as a you know i i train if i go to the beach and i find you know whether it's stretching whether it's uh doing some mobility stuff whatever it might be i i try to just incorporate it into my everyday activities and that keeps it fresh and keeps your mind connected to the to the movement. Yep, that that's great advice. And you you mentioned YouTube. We're fortunate to have it now. Uh, I've also got a couple of apps on my phone. And so if somebody can't make it to class as often as they'd like, I I just if I'm in traffic or if I go someplace and I have to stop for 15 minutes and wait on somebody, I'll just open an app and uh, watch a couple quick videos. Yep, yep, and it helps. It helps to keep it fresh in your mind, you know. Yeah. I watch matches all the time. I like watching black belt matches. I like to see what they're doing. I like to see what works. And I do a lot of rewinding and analyzing because back in the old days, we only had VHS tapes that were all scrambly and, and, and grainy from, you know, some Brazil competition. And you you got to find it. Whoa, what happened there? You know, how did he get that sweep? And, and, you know, you'd have to figure out, well, where was his hand? Was he grabbing there? Really, the, the devil's in the details with this jiu-jitsu. And, and there's no better better time to look at techniques and break them down 
as when you see high level competitors being successful with a technique. So what led up to that point? You know, how did that, how did that all come together and that that technique worked? And, and I think that's something that, you know, you need, you need patience and you need to be observant and you really need, okay, that was a sweep, good sweep, not just to look at it and say, oh, that, but did he, why, it was a scissor sweep, but was it really, did he, was it just a normal scissor sweep or did something happen that made that scissor sweep really effective and find that key, what is it that made it really effective? And I think that helps a lot. Yeah, that's, and that, that's, that's what I look for, you know, it's just. Oh, I see, you know, <laughs> I, I see how Leandro Lowe got swept. And, and if, if he got swept with that setup, you're pretty much going to sweep anybody if you set up the same. So let me ask you a question. This wasn't on my list of questions, but you're talking brought it to mind. Would you advise a uh, four stripe white belt, a new blue belt? Should they also be watching mostly black belt matches because that's the highest level, or should they spend a good bit of time watching blue and purple belt matches? I think nowadays, blue, I mean, I watch blue, I watch purple, brown, black, um, and just, I, I think it's all of value. I'll skip white belt right now. White belt is, for me, watching white belt is just to see, okay, you know, how are my students doing technically in comparison? Because I see a lot of things in the white belt. Obviously, as a more experienced grappler, player, you're going to notice things. Um, I think, I mean, people may make mistakes. Black belts will make mistakes. It, it's the ability for the for the observer to be able to see, oh, they made a mistake. That was a mistake, you know. And was it a was it a a novice mistake or was it an advanced mistake or did did that mistake happen because their opponent made them make that mistake? And so again, it's a- analyzing it. And so, it, but it's going to benefit. I think it's going to benefit to watch blue, purple, brown, and black if it's a good match, and not to watch the whole thing, but to pick out specific things. Did you see that match as a, as a blue belt or even as a white belt, and say, okay, what did you notice in that match? How many techniques, actual techniques, could you pick out? Um, and that would give you, that gives you kind of an idea of your knowledge. You know, did you just see it as a jumble of moves that ended up in a submission, or did you see specific things? Half guard, half guard escape, the technique that your instructor taught you for escaping uh, side control. What, you know, did you notice, did you notice what was really going on? And so that, that I think as an exercise can be very helpful. Yeah, because at the black belt level for uh, newer grapplers, it happens so fast, and they transition between techniques. I mean, they'll be a quarter of the way into one technique, and based on their opponent's reaction, they, they'll just transition into the next one. And, yeah, sometimes it's hard to pick out the individual techniques. That's a good exercise, Nick. Yeah, yeah definitely. So i got two more questions on the list, and I think this one is pretty pertinent right now. Uh, I, we get asked oftentimes how to deal with injury. Usually it's, uh, you know, I tweaked my knee. Doctor says it's, uh, you know, it's going to heal on its own, but I need to take some time off. How do, how do you advise students or what advice would you have for students that uh, are trying to come back? Is it and- your left knee or your right knee? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right right as you slap and bump, right? Does it hurt, it? Does it hurt when it's straight? Which knee is it? So, so. If it's your left knee, so you can shrimp on your left side because you're going to bend your right leg, right? And you're going to push off and go to the left. So you can shrimp that way. It's not going to bother your knee, right? Can you bridge? <laughs> I, I think I think I'm of the philosophy of that. What can you do? Not what you can't do. You know, I I don't believe in taking time off for such injuries. I believe that there's always something that you do that that is going to keep you uh, current and is going to, is going to give you that kind of feeling of, you know, I'm, I'm becoming more disciplined because even in the face of adversity, I'm there and I'm able to participate in the class in some way. Um, 
and and it's going to benefit me. You know, whether it is even if you can't do anything at all and you just go and you sit on the sidelines and you watch the class and you watch what's going on, you watch the techniques being taught, you're still going to benefit from because you're inside of it. So I think time off is is to me it, it's it's unless you you really need it for psychological reasons or something. Like, like I could tell you, even in my hospital bed in the in the ICU, all I could think about was, okay, how long is it going to take before I can get back to the mat, and how long is it going to take before I can roll again? You know, because I really want to roll, and my girlfriend won't let me roll. Well, she she tried to stop me, but I still kind of roll a little bit. <laughs> well, I'm glad you got somebody looking out for you. Yeah, she is. She she does, but. uh so, yeah. so your so your advice is definitely definitely come to class. The knees of the elbows of all these sorts of things. It's never stopped me personally from going to class, and I try to pass that on to my students and say, look, I understand there's things you can't do, but there's also things you can do that are going to benefit you. And I think that coming in and taking that hour or hour and a half and doing those things is going to benefit your jiu-jitsu in the long run and you're going to be a lot happier than if you stop training for the two to three weeks it takes for that injury to completely heal and then come back and start training again. Because after two to three weeks, you've lost a lot, you know, and you have, and risk, as you have, and you haven't been connected to it, you risk something else happening. And then it, it's, I think, can become a downward spiral where you're like, eh, those two weeks, I was having a good time. I was going out to the bar. I was drinking some beers. I got a new girlfriend, and I, maybe I'm going to go that direction. You know, <laughs> so I, I think it's good to keep keep things in focus and in perspective. And I think jujitsu is a good thing to focus on. Awesome, that's good advice. Last last one, and we can both relate to this. Well, not being new necessarily in our fifties, but. Uh, uh, it's getting more and more common for older guys, older people to start jujitsu. So you got someone coming in saying, I'm just starting. I'm 50 years old and they kind of want to know how their training and how their jujitsu is going to look different than the 25 year olds they see on the mats. Uh, what advice do you have for them starting? Um, yeah, go ahead. Starting at a, starting at a, a more advanced age. Yes. Starting you know, I have a lot of students in my school, and they are between the age of like 30 and mid 40s. Um, and so this this does come up, and and I think again, it, it's a matter of listening to your body, training smart, the resource you have available to you for for different different uh, information about jujitsu and about about the basics and about the, the foundation of jujitsu. And, um, I think not trying to compete with your younger, uh, fellow teammates and students, not competing against them, but trying to have them help you to, to continue to progress is, is really important. I mean, I'm, I'm big on, I, I watch, you know, my students, I, I, I won't allow a student to be can come in a lot of different ways, even though the, the younger guy maybe doesn't think he was bullying. But I can see that in the, that, that was a little bit of bullying, you know, because the, the older guy might be like really like, God, I'm not going to get beat by this kid and I'm, I'm going to get him and starts going really hard. And then the kid starts going really hard with him and the loser of that battle is usually the older guy who ends up getting injured. And I tell my younger students, look, if, if the guy starts to come back at you really hard, don't, don't be stubborn. Just lay, they don't lay on your back and let it happen. And we can talk about it later. Cause he's going to, I think the most important thing is, is not to get hurt because I've had mo a lot of students who, like we'll hurt a rib, for example. Ribs, I don't know if, if you get the same experience, but ribs seem to be the thing that make people quit jujitsu. They get stuck in a side control, they twist, they pop an intercostal muscle, which hurts like hell, and then you don't see them for a couple of weeks, and sometimes you don't see them at all, again, because of that kind of injury. Mm -hmm. And 
and that that's the you know it's that one strange injury that happens from person a hard control on you or you get thrown to the ground and you hit the ground and you're not really good at break falling yet and you get that popped intercostal muscle and sometimes even a rib that cracks a little bit and that is sometimes the end of that new student especially in the white belt category um so i think as advice for older people starting jujitsu is to take it slow take it slow be patient slowly get yourself in shape go do some other kind of exercise as well go get the um, out of every drill that you're told to do during class if you're doing drills make sure you do them correctly that you take your time that you understand the drill because those mobility drills and how to move properly and gracefully it, it's it's really important to pay attention to the details yep. so that's that's the advice i would give yeah one thing i would add you're talking about drilling the techniques and, and getting the most out of them as an older guy uh, I can tell you that a lot of times the technique is shown and I'm just having a hard time contorting my body in the way that I need to to complete the technique. For you older guys out there, don't be afraid to ask. I always ask my coach, hey, you got an old man version of this? And usually it's just uh, changing the angle a little bit, moving my hips a little bit. They've got an answer. So if you can't, yeah. if you can't complete a technique and you think it's because of your physical limitations, just ask the coach and they'll help you. Definitely, definitely. I think that's, you know, and that's a really important thing to bring up is like ask your coach because that's what he's there for or she's there for is to teach you proper movement, proper technique, the techniques that suit you that are going to work for your body type, for your shape, for your age, for your flexibility. If you're some teenage kid, I'm a teenage kid, I'm going to show him a birambolo. Now, I'm not super good at birambolo, but I can describe it. And I can kind of show how to do it. And then I'm like, that's how you do it. You try it. And then while they're doing it, I put their foot where it needs to be. And they're, you know, I can push their foot over their head and stuff it into the ground. And I know they can bend like that. And then all of a sudden they're doing it perfect. And I'm like, that's it. Yep. And, you know, this is, it, it's important because that, I mean, I've recently started teaching kids. So I have a kids class for this. I didn't have before the last time we talked, but my kids are six to 11 years old is the age group nice problem and they're awesome and they can they bounce you know they fall <laughs> down on the ground and bounce back up so you can show them throws and rollovers and all this stuff and they're just they just do it they're like little sponges and they never get hurt and even their their shoulder gets bent in a circle and they're like oh that really hurt okay i'm okay i can go again you know <laughs> <laughs> the kids are like that so it's going to be a different thing you know and as I was saying before, you know, as as a as a instructor, you have to look at every body type, age, physicality individually and what they're what they are able to do, you know. So yeah. Perfect. Well, Nick, that about wraps up the material I had, and I've had you on here about an hour. I want to say I appreciate your time. Uh, glad you're feeling better. Any, anything you want to close with? Anybody you want to give a shout out to or anything before we go? Well, always want to give a shout out to my instructor, Marcelo Alonso in Seattle and the whole MABJJ team. Um, they've always, they've always been there. And, and I want to give a shout out to all the people that, you know, wished me well on this last little episode. I hope that I hope that they're all doing great and uh you know keep living the jiu-jitsu dream and and have fun with it and don't take yourself or others too seriously um and just enjoy it you know the journey and I think that that pretty much wraps it up yeah all right man it's been great catching up with you and having you back on here Nick thanks Joe all Appreciate right it. We should do another, you know, you ever watch that Jerry Seinfeld thing of uh, comedians in cars having coffee? I don't think I caught that one. No? No. <laughs> because I saw uh, grapplers having coffee. Like, it's a very similar thing to comedians in cars having coffee. And they just kind of 
shoot the breeze about jujitsu and while the comedians shoot the breeze about whatever is comical. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm down for that, man. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, boss. Well, uh, listen, Joe, thank you very much. Appreciate the time. And, uh, BJJ Brick is awesome. As I said, it's inspired a lot of people to come and come and join my academy and also visit my academy. So I have you guys to thank for, for some of that, which is great. Um, I appreciate the kind words. One other shout out to Nikki Ruddy, who is the designer of our logo for the Nick BJJ team, as well as the uh, manifesto that we wrote. And I'll, I'll read the manifesto just really quick, okay? Okay, go. Through our love of the art, we connect. From all corners of this beautiful planet, we connect through our love of BJJ. Talk with anyone who has rolled, and they get it. They get the daily grind. They get the healthy addiction. They get why BJJ favorite conversation. We founded our brand on this idea to spread more passion for the sport, one new student at a time. As practitioners, mentors, coaches, we are all on our independent journeys, yet radically responsible for the pursuit of excellence in ourselves, our teammates, and everyone who walks through the door. We celebrate the mental growth that often shines brighter than the physical benefits. We honor the unique friendships developed through the trust of the tap. Trust is the ultimate evidence of love, and we love connecting with you to train authentic Brazilian jiu-jitsu on our mat. We love connection. We are Nick BJJ and BJJ in general. Us. Man, that's awesome. Uh, can I find a written version of that on your website? Uh, I'll, yeah, it's on, I think, is it on our website, Nicky? No, I'll send it to you. I appreciate it, man. That was awesome. Not on our website. She's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. All right, I got to go to work. We'll talk to you later. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right, it was great having Nick on the show. Just a quick update. Uh, I've been in touch with him uh, throughout and his his condition is improving he has some answers uh comes come turns out that he's got a 20 percent blockage in uh in his system there and the doctor's got him on some meds some blood thinners and uh, uh he's on a on a little bit of a he, he's he's toned down his training a little bit he's been hardcore and he works really hard and he's just trying to keep it toned down a little bit he's back to light rolling he's been instructing throughout and still running his school so he's doing good and uh all the best to him yeah we definitely appreciate him getting on here and and sharing his story and this just reminds me that uh it's important to take care of yourself and I think in jiu-jitsu, we're fortunate we have a physical activity that we enjoy. It helps keep us, you know, in shape. And, and so a lot of those uh, boxes that that are health-related get checked just because we're physically active. Like, like if you exercise, that's really good for you. And so we're doing that. But there's so many other things with your body that, that need kind of regular maintenance. And it it kind of drives me crazy the guys and i think gary might be one of them that don't go and, and go to the doctor occasionally to get get checked on or or whatever i'm not trying to call you out here gary but like uh, every year i go get just like kind of a physical to get some blood work done and to see where i'm at and make sure i'm not you know shrinking at a rate that's too unacceptable for my age because i'm getting older now guys i'm shrinking um <laughs> i shouldn't have throw that one out there that's too easy <laughs> Uh, That's what talking she about said. Height here, guys. <laughs> no, uh, it's just it makes my you know different things are okay because you could you could look really healthy, you could feel really good, but I could my cholesterol is a little bit high, or you know something else like that might be a little off. And it's it, it's important if you get a hold of these early on, they're way easier to to address. So well, go Byron, out there, Gary. You should go to the doctor occasionally. <laughs> get some, uh, get, get uh, seen, and, and make sure you're, you're doing good because you look really good, and uh, you know you're getting. Thank you. But you don't know how how things are under the hood. You open that hood up, and there's steam coming out of that, and smoke is bellowing <laughs> out of that thing. <laughs> Nobody wants to open Byron, Gary's hood, but the doctor gets paid to do that. Yeah, but the smoke is coming out from the hood on the backside. That's kind of strange. <laughs> 
You know, something something else this made us think about when uh, Byron and I were first talking about that is, you know, how well equipped is your gym to handle this type of a scenario? And, and you know, then Gary talked about the guy that passed out the Y. So this is definitely something that can happen. And so it got us to wondering if your gym had any kind of emergency response plan in place. Um, do you do you collect contact information? I, I think a lot of schools do now. I think that's a great idea. You have people sign a release form when they come in. If you've got a spot on there for like, uh, uh, you know, emergency contact would be great. If uh, if I fell out in class and they had to rush me to the emergency room, man, I'd really love it if somebody could contact my wife and have her meet me there. So, uh, guys, what do you think about that? Anything in place at your gym that you know of, or any ideas? Yeah, that's a that's a great idea. I don't know uh, w- what they're doing at Fox as far as that goes, but it is very helpful to have that information. And it just takes a second, you know. Just have most. I think most gyms or, or a lot of gyms are using some sort of a digital sign up form. Just put it on there, the form like emergency contact, and then you, you know you write mom or wife or husband, what, whoever it is that you want them to call, and maybe list a couple people if you're not able to tell them that number. And and that does happen. I, I, I was at a major uh, grocery store here in town, you know, big chain, and one of their employees was having some hard, hard time and was unable to talk to us. I'm like, well, what's the emergency contact information? They didn't have any. <laughs> I was shocked. I was like, this, is a, this isn't like a little mom and pa store. This, I mean, this, there's tons of these stores all over, you know, the Midwest, and they didn't have any emergency contact information. It just seemed like a major... Uh, loophole in, in in their human resources system, and I think just as a as a degree of customer service to your students, if you get that, it's pretty rare to need it. But when you do need it, it's greatly appreciated. Like, hey, we we called we called your husband. He'll be on his way to the hospital. He'll meet you there, um, and that's a huge relief versus. Trying to scramble through. Does anybody know? I mean, how many how many students? And there's definitely some for sure that you know their spouse because they're either they do jujitsu as well or uh, they're involved a lot and they come by. Maybe even on social media, whatever. But a lot of students, you have no idea uh, they're off the mat life. They just come in and they train and they go home. You don't know anything really about that. Or, or who those people would be. And so to be able to help them, who would you want to, us to contact? Um, that's a big one. And then also in the same file is like any sort of thing that would uh, be relevant to your medical history. You know, are you diabetic? I mean, that's pretty relevant. You could you could have a, a situation where you're, you know, confused or you don't know what's what's going on. You're unable to tell us. But if usually somebody would know. But if you put that in the file, yeah, uh, I'm diabetic and and occasionally, you know, occasionally have some issues with that. That might happen on the mats. And if you pull up the file and it says that, or you pull up the file and it says, you know, that this person prefers to go to this location if, if a medical thing happens, those, that's all helpful information. And, you know, don't forget to have an a interval. Uh, you know, it may be quarterly, it may be uh, bi-yearly, it may be yearly, but to update that information. Um, you know, if I signed up, Six years ago, uh, you know, who knows if I have the the same, uh, you know, emergency contact or if they even have the same numbers or if I even have the same numbers. So uh, it's always good just to, uh, you know, have a, a certain interview or a certain time that you're always going to uh, uh, update that information. And uh, uh, so you do have it uh, updated and it's uh, it's correct if there is a it is a problem that happens. Yeah, so just something to keep in mind. Uh, Gary, when you started talking, I thought you were going to say, who knows if I even have the same spouse. And I was going to say, if she hasn't left you by now, you're probably okay, brother. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But it's good to have a plan. It's it's, uh, consider that, if you're a gym owner, a customer service. Don't think of it as uh, as like a burden. Hey, guys, get this down. No, you're, you're actually doing it to help them. If need be, and it might just be something as simple as uh, somebody you know is going to have their arm looked at. Well, do you want to add? Do you, do you who would you know? Yeah, they can call, but if you could take that off their plate and they could just you know ice it and get it stabilized and and that sort of thing, it'd be a little easier if uh, they didn't have to add that one more stress. 
And I've made those phone calls as a firefighter, you know, like uh, we'll be there and you have emergency contact information. Do you want me to call, you know, your spouse and, and see what they want us to do? Because sometimes it's just hard to make the decision. I don't know what I should do. Should I go? Should I not go? Or are they, maybe they'll give me a ride if they're close. Like I'll, I'll pull up my cell phone and call and, hey, you know, this is Brian with the fire department. I'm here with... Uh, with with Joe, Joe has apparently uh, stubbed his toe again, and <laughs> you know wh- well, whatever the, the and, and, size of that toe, you can't miss it. The, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it looks really bad, but it, his other one looks the same. <laughs> 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 but it, it's all th- consider it a customer service to collect that information, and uh, and that's just something you could do to help your students have a uh, uh, a better experience if the experience kind of goes south. So I think it's important. Good, good, uh, good idea, Joe. Yeah. So, do you have an emergency response plan? Was a question that Byron and I had, but we also had a question sent in by one of our listeners, and they said, "As a blue belt, I'm going to try no gi for the first time. Any tips?" And my first thought is, you know, get in your time machine and go back to the first month you were training jujitsu <laughs> and start start to train a little of both. But if, like me, you can't afford a time machine, and you are going. For your first time, I've talked to very few people who actually have made a clear blue belt and haven't done any no gi. So um, I, I can see where it could be a little bit intimidating. Uh, Byron, Gary, what would you have for this guy? You know, I just say try it, have fun. Um, it is going to be different because you're 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 not going to have your grips. Uh, that's the one thing I hear all the time. Um, but you kind of can have grips i mean uh you just have to work with overhooks or or underhooks uh because you're and wrist control you know i think are huge things you're not gonna have the collar to grab you're not gonna have the pants or the sleeves to grab so uh you know just improvise and and you know that's what jiu-jitsu is all about improvising you know we improvise in the gi we improvise no gi but it will take some time to get used to the grip parts uh um uh you know for me, it's really overhooks, wrist control, bicep control, um, without you know grabbing uh, cloth. Uh, but uh, um, you know, it it'll take a little time. But just go out there and have fun and uh, have a smile on your face while you're doing it. Yeah, as, as a blue belt who's never trained no gi, if that's where you're at, you're gonna love it. You're gonna love no gi. There's so many cool things about it. Uh, all those times where. You get that person who has passed your guard and has crazy good pressure, and you cannot move. They're holding your lapel. You're you're, you're pinned down. That doesn't happen in Noki. The, the, if you can escape, unless you're rolling some, with Byron, <laughs> Byron's side control is brutal. If you can escape someone's no gi side uh, or gi side control, you'll fly right out of there. No gi side control. Like, the, the, appreciate the different aspects of it. Yes, some of your submissions won't be even exist. Some of your gi chokes obviously aren't going to be there. Some of your setups with your arm bars or whatever, uh, you're going to have to change those, and they won't be as strong because your grips are super strong. But the other aspect of it is that it's more fluid. It's hard to 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 pressure and punish somebody when they get in a bad spot. The escapes are a lot easier, I think. And just just appreciate the positives of it. I think, you know, as a blue belt, you'll probably have a learning curve, maybe a month or maybe two, until you, like, have really clicked and, and are used to it. It depends on how much of your gi, how much of your game is gi dependent. But really, you'll, you'll pick it right up, uh, embrace the, the positive aspects of no gi, and uh, it won't take you long. You'll, you'll really enjoy it. And then you have, potentially, depending on your school, double the amount of training sessions you can go do. So if they do every other day is gi or no gi, whatever, and you only train those gi days, but so it's Wednesday, I can't go train because I'm not no gi. No, you double the times you can get on the mat and get some training in, and they're almost the same thing. If you train both, you'll really see that and you'll experience that. So I, you know, I welcome you to the uh, the no gi mats. You're gonna love it. Take a little bit of adjustment, but there are some great things with no gi. Yeah, I've got two more tips. Uh, first of all, take a good hot bath in Epsom salt and essential oils and when you get to class and you start sweating you'll be slippery as hell nobody will be able to hold on to you but the second thing i want to say this isn't so much advice but well maybe it is if you don't enjoy that first class so much you find it difficult go back for a second one go back for a third one like byron says stick with it for a month or two because you'll see your gi game get much better good point Hey, Joe, I, I just wanted to share a funny, you were talking about that guy with a, or take the Epsom salt bath with essential oils. Uh, Byron and I and Becky were talking yesterday, 
And they were telling me a guy showed up uh, one day after having a massage with oils on it and just showed straight up to jujitsu. <laughs> and Byron and Becky both rolled and, uh, you know, they're like, what the freak? You know, what? why are you so slippery? And I, I just had a massage. And uh, I actually just thought that was kind of funny when I heard that. And then you just bring this up. So, so yeah, maybe that's a good idea. Yeah. And then, so uh, part of that involved telling the person, hey, next time you get a massage, it wouldn't hurt to to get clean that oil off you because it's kind of uh <laughs> it wasn't terrible it was slippery and it definitely had an aroma to it that is not it's stronger than you want with jujitsu like I, yeah so uh he wouldn't have known if i didn't mention that you know hey actually that's probably not the best plan and i don't recommend that you go get the massage without showering after jujitsu either like that <laughs> think about the the masseuses doing that like man you you, you What's going on here? You know, you're all sweaty. You you, you, you smell terrible. I don't know. So <laughs> part for me, and I think for a lot of people, jiu-jitsu is in a, in a strange degree of workout where you, it's perfectly acceptable, if not recommended, depending on what you've been doing, to shower before you work out. That's the thing. You know, that goes back to what we were just talking about being embarrassed, too. Um, you know, I never thought of it that way, but. If, you know, I just say, geez, man, you stink. What's your problem? Get, you know, go change. You know, how is that person going to feel? Are, are they going to come back? Uh, you know, man, what what's your problem? Why would you uh, do a massage first and come in here with oils all over your body? Um, you know, there's a way to say it to somebody to, uh, you know, to keep them coming back and, you know, make them, you know, have some dignity, you know, well, and instead of just trashing them about it. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good one, Joe or Gary. As far as I, you know, I do want the person back. You don't want to make them feel bad about it, but you do need to let them know. So having a little bit of yeah. tact and to yeah. and to do that in a proper way. But I I like what you're saying there, Byron, about showering. You know, it, it's perfectly acceptable to shower beforehand. I mean, um, you know, I shower. Um, you know, there's one one day I train right after work. You know, I put deodorant on again, like just uh, just to make sure I, you know, haven't stunk up during the day. I don't want to uh, uh, be the guy who stinks out my training partner. And that took several yep. conversations to get Gary to actually do that, but he kept advocating <laughs> for that. And well, well, Christmas gift was the deodorant the, and the underarm side, but I still have problem with that steam coming out of my back. Then, so. Uh, <laughs> Like you said, Byron, maybe I need to go to the doctor to check out that steam. <laughs> there you go, Gary. Please. <laughs> You're just asking him overall. But, you know, you have now embarrassed me on, on national radio. <laughs> I mean, we are the number two ranked. Yeah, we are the number two ranked uh, martial arts podcast in the world. So uh, a lot of people are listening. But you got thick skin, Gary. And that's part of the, what the doctor's going to help you with. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways... Uh, yeah, have fun as a Noki person. If that's where this started from, I don't even remember. But uh, guys, I want to give a quick shout out to some of our Patreon supporters. Richard, who we've met, uh, he came to Wichita. Jamie and Adam, uh, thank you guys for your continued support on Patreon. Uh, what what they have done is they thought, hey, this is a pretty decent podcast. I like to help these people out and support the podcast. There are definitely costs that happen, and uh, it, it definitely helps provide that support to keep us going so uh, look on the show notes there's the thing this is patreon has a little picture there click on that take you to the patreon page uh, it's a website designed to help produce help content producers uh, get some support and so most people pledge like a dollar two or three per episode and when you do that at the end of the month it uh, all your pledges are sent in and uh, the money goes and helps keep the show going and as a token of appreciation i'll mail you a five inch bjj brick gi patch both of them the the uh the throwback patch that we've had for years and then our new gi patch uh that people are loving because it has joe on there man it looks great with joe on there and uh and i still got some stickers left as well uh I'd like to send you that i can send it anywhere in the world so uh sign up and that's a token of our uh, appreciation. If you put your address in there, I'll mail them right out. Also, we have a private Facebook group that we invite uh, the Patreon supporters to join. So if you're on Patreon supporting us and you haven't joined yet, send me a message and let me know your Facebook page, and I'll get you added to the group. 
Uh, the easiest way to get a hold of us is, uh, I guess, uh, bjjbrick at gmail.com. I'll see that. Or you can message us on our Facebook page. The uh, Not the private group, but the page itself has a messaging system as well. Man, kind of rambling here. Joe's good at managing that. We appreciate that. The Facebook page, that is, not Byron's rambling. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody but can you, manage that. You can always stop the Byron's rambling with a well-placed choke. That'll stop. I feel like yes, I'm getting choked indeed. right now. I'm getting a little choked up. <laughs> but uh, anyway, had a great great time. I want to thank Nick and, and uh, clearly uh, our thoughts and, and prayers are with Nick as he's uh, doing well. And, and uh, I think this happens to, you know, any, at any, some point in time, your health is going to give you some problems. It's just a matter of time. And if you uh, tackle like Nick did and, and, and we're glad he's able to Stay on the mat. He's able to put some uh, some kind of some boundaries on him, and I'm guessing he's changing the way he's rolling. That's that's what he's doing, and I'm guessing he'll learn new things about jujitsu just by doing that, just by altering, you know, not going as hard, by by selecting his training partners a little bit better. Maybe he'll discover a different side of his own jujitsu that is going to really blossom. And and uh, versus if he kept doing the same thing for another five years, you know, like. Uh, the same style of rolling. He's changing his style of rolling, and he's going to learn some cool things. So, uh, I, I I wish him the best in his jujitsu journey, taking a little bit of a change. But in the long run, I think he'll definitely be able to adapt his game and, and come up and be a great martial artist through his new avenue. And tell, hey guys, had a great time this week, and uh, thank you, Joe, for doing the interview. It's great to have uh, Joe interview Nick. That's a uh, it's always a treat. <laughs> so. We'll see you guys next week. Until then, stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to shower to wash off the essential oils from your massage. (laughs) Yep. Train hard, uh, train clean, train smart, get better, guys. We'll see you on the mats. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu.